Good morning and welcome to Online Church with Pastor D. I'm looking forward to a wonderful time in God's presence around God's Word today. If you notice that uh, while I'm sharing that the lighting changes, especially on my face, it is because the weather keeps changing and I, I rely uh, very heavily on natural light. And uh, since I've set up for this morning's broadcast, the skies have become quite gray. So. I can't make adjustments while I'm sharing, so just bear with me as we go with this broadcast today. Welcome to Online Church with Pastor D. I'm here usually every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock live on Facebook, after which my message is uploaded to YouTube, to my channel, which is Pastor D. And uh, just checking to make sure that my mic is on and that you're hearing me. Um, and as I share with you, I, I want you to know that you can get in touch with me anytime through email. That's phildbage, B-A-J-E, at gmail.com. Or you can WhatsApp me at one two four six two five five seven nine five three. Thank you again for your prayers. I do want to ask for an extension. If you would, those of you who have been praying for me over the last couple of weeks, uh, I pray that you will continue to pray for me. Give me one more week, please. I would appreciate that very much. Uh, and there is a prayer initiative coming soon that I've announced for about two weeks now, where we will have on Facebook Christians praying for Christians. Uh, but you will hear more about that as it comes online. That's James 127 Prayer Network. And then, of course, there is the Christmas blessing that I've been sharing with you about. There's a quick picture there of some of the baskets that we gave out last year uh, for the Christmas blessing and uh, I want to do this um, by the middle of December to give people time. We're not doing the baskets this year as I mentioned to you. What we are doing is grocery vouchers so folk can go to the supermarket and they can buy what they want. We want to give them something healthy. I don't mean in terms of food but in terms of the actual gift. Um, so that they can break it up and use it as they need. We won't give them things they don't want or they don't like or they can't use or they have already. So we want to do that and I want you to participate. Uh, several of you gave last year and we really appreciate that. I, I have a testimony for you and um, I'm going to put up a couple of images as I share this testimony. Uh, this is uh, a group of children in an area called KGF, which is Kola Gold Fields, in India. I went to India on a mission trip um, in 2019, or November of 2019. It was a life-changing uh, event in my life. And the Lord sent me there on my own. It was just no team, just me. And I went to minister to orphans and children, like you see in the picture here. And um, the, I will show you a picture in, in three shots of the pastor who deals with that. And he normally is on. I don't know if he's on yet. But if you read through the comments, he will normally say good evening. That's because in India, they are, I think, somewhere between 9 and 12 hours ahead of us. Anyway, the testimony is this. As I went to the doctor, I had to go to the doctor last week. And uh, this is a picture you see on the screen of some of the girls' outfits. What happened was that uh, I gave the pastor a gift to buy uh, outfits for the children, Christmas gifts, but he buys outfits because some of them, they don't really get very, very poor area. They don't get many outfits and things like that during the year. So he makes sure he buys them an outfit. This is the girls. This is the boys coming right up here. Let me take off this one, right? This is the boys. Some of the boys' outfits that they got, nice pair of jeans and a top, so they can be all spiffy for the Christmas season. And then I will take this off and put for you the pastor as he's giving out some of the gifts to the young ladies. Um, and so I went to the doctor, and the first thing I did <laughs> is to witness to the doctor. And I asked him if he got his life right with the Lord yet, and he hadn't done so, and I asked him to take it very seriously as I share with him I'm cutting out quite a bit of it but long story short I, I ended up sharing with him about this very visit to India to minister to the children this is Pastor Enoch Samuel right there on the screen a wonderful brother in the Lord gave me a lovely meal I sat with his wife and family and, and we had a, 
great time of fellowship together. And ever since then, every Christmas, I send him money to bless the children and to help pay the teachers and, and the staff in the after school program that he has. Uh, that's the only way that these children can have any kind of a future because the area is so poor. And so, uh, again, long story short, I've already taken too much time, with the doctor, as I shared with the doctor, uh, when I was finished with the, the test and, and the consultation, the doctor, who was not a Christian, gave me his fee for India, for the children. And I left on a high. That's the first time I ever knew of going into a doctor's office and the doctor paid the patient rather than the patient paying the doctor. But it wasn't a payment for me, it was a payment for the children. And, and this is just a, a small example of that. Now, I haven't asked you for money for the children uh, in India. And the reason is that I want you to give for the needy folk in Barbados. I do have some donors who have given me the last couple of years and they have been tremendous help in blessing the children. Of course, the Lord lays on your heart by all means, but I am asking you for um, a, a donation, a contribution towards helping folk at Christmas time in Barbados. If you want to give towards the children of India, you just need to indicate that, but this is not what I am asking for today. Uh, so that's it. I, I just want to share that with you. I think it's a wonderful testimony that I was blessed with money from someone who really doesn't know me that well, but, you know, my medical doctor, and he was able to bless me for the children. This is very, very special uh, indeed. So here we are today. Uh, I'm finished with my, my promo, and now let's get into the word for the occasion. Uh, thank you again for your prayers and for your strength. It means a lot to me in this season of my life. Last week, as we were talking about a serious call to action, I ended on Proverbs 14, verse 34, which says that righteousness exalteth a nation, uh, but sin is a reproach to any people. In the Amplified, same verse, 1434, Proverbs, uprightness and right standing with God, moral and spiritual rectitude in every area and relation elevate a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. Beloved, I've been talking about a serious call to action, and I want to finish that and then go into my third and final point, which I will start today, but I will finish it uh, next week as well as finish this series as well. Can you hear it? A serious call. So here we are. Uh, the church needs to fight for the establishment and preservation of righteousness, unfortunately, this will automatically put us in confrontation with sin and unrighteousness. We, we get a debate from people saying, but why are you all attacking sin and attacking unrighteousness? The reality is if we attack or agitate for righteousness, it automatically puts us on the offensive for sin and unrighteousness. I'm not saying that we've been perfect in everything we've done, but hear what I'm sharing with you today. The church and every child of God needs to consistently agitate for national righteousness. That's a good place to say amen. But as I mentioned in closing last week, what we need is for every child of God to do so, that is agitate for righteousness, uh, in their area or their sphere of influence. This is very important. We have been so inactive for so long that it is offensive for some people for a minister to call for them to become active and to become involved in the fight for righteousness and, as I said, by extension, against unrighteousness and sin. So my thing is, as I'm introducing this topic for today, Wherever you are, wherever you can make your voice heard or you have influence or you have an impact, you need to exercise that in the name of Jesus Christ. That's very, very important, very important statement that I made 
to you there just now. So let me move into the practical side of it. How can we practically agitate for righteousness in our nation or in every area that we can find? And I'll tell you this, you may not find this first suggestion in terms of practically doing this, you may not find it uh, very familiar necessarily. Um, but I suggest if we want to practically fight for righteousness, that we lift up the name of Jesus. That's number one. Seems a little strange, but yeah, if we want to agitate for righteousness in this nation, we need to lift up the name of Jesus. All of us, from preachers to um, evangelists and the ordinary woman at the well, you will understand that. Every single person who has had a life-changing encounter with the person of Jesus Christ needs to talk about Jesus wherever you are. Amen again. Huh? Wherever you live, wherever you work, and wherever you go. Social media, airwaves, calling programs, newspapers, rallies, marches, social groups. I know I'm just kind of listing them, but some may catch your attention, catch your ear. We need to lift up the name of Jesus in every opportunity that comes our way, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Lift up the name of Jesus. Let me throw this in here quickly, and I think this is a very salient point in this matter. It is not always what you do, beloved. Many times it is how you do it. You got me? There are people who will, who will really make the effort to lift up the name of Jesus, but the way they do it turns people off. You, you, you can understand that, right? So just be uh, conscious of not what you're doing, but how you are doing it. But either way, do it. Lift up the name of Jesus. That's one way we can agitate for righteousness in this nation. Let me borrow from my brother Corey Worrell. I, I, I mentioned uh, something that he had done regarding one of the schools with the, with the uh, chemical toilets outside. I, I forgot to mention his name. My wife pointed out after I was done. Uh, but it was Corey Worrell who did that. And, and I want to borrow from him another post that he, that he made on social media which I'm talking about here and he said this this is regarding gun violence in Barbados listen to what he says um, the Prime Minister, Attorney General, Government, Police, Barbados Defense Force, Judicial System or legislation can't solve the gun and violence issue in Barbados why? Good question. Why would he make a statement like that? He says because the root of the problem is actually a heart issue. The issue is not the guns and the violence. The issue is the heart. So you can either put a plaster on the sore or you can deal with the source of the sore. And that's what he's talking about. What we have traditionally done and what the government and many other people are doing is that they're putting more and more plasters over sores but it doesn't solve the problem so I, I thought what he said was very 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 critical um, and I, I'll say this to you the only person who can actually solve a heart problem is Jesus so He's lifting up the name of Jesus in a little bit of a roundabout way but he's lifting up the name of Jesus in the opportunity that he has on social media. I have very great respect for this brother uh, as he shares and he highlights uh, issues in our nation and I think it is very, very powerful, the ministry that God has given him. Number two, second way that we can practically um, agitate for righteousness in our nation. Of course, if you're not from Barbados, wherever you are, whatever nation you reside in, you can lift up the name of Jesus as well using some of these same avenues that I have highlighted here. Number two, the second way we can, we can do this, uh, this will not be popular, but it needs to be said. We need to work with other religions 
Hello? We need to work with other religions, organizations, and national social efforts as long as it does not violate biblical principles. All right? Some of you will not like this. That's quite all right. No problem right here. Okay? As long as it doesn't violate biblical principles, we need to work with other organizations, Christian or non-Christian, that are working towards making a positive change in this nation. I'll talk more about that in a little while. All right? You have um, issues of morality. You have issues of destructive social activities that take place in our nation and our shores and uh, we need to agitate and work with other organizations that will speak up for right doing amen uh gun violence the same gun violence that we've talked about a little bit uh walk for the cure this happened just a few weeks ago in barbados where uh they were raising um awareness of breast cancer and stuff like that and the, the funds that were raised from this walk were given to I believe the Barbados Cancer Society uh, those things are very very important and very very good and healthy for a nation and then speaking of a nation the nation coming up I believe is next weekend the, the fun athlon this is a, a term that they, they coined for this event and they are walking, riding, and skating, if I remember correctly, uh, or walking, walking, running, and skating for a greener, more eco-friendly Barbados. Uh, we have the opportunity to work towards making uh, life more uh, healthy in this nation, any other nation that you may be in. This is one way that we can be a part of that. The church may not have any programs that speak to these issues, but the church can get involved with programs that speak to these issues. I know you say, but this doesn't sound very spiritual. Oh, it's very spiritual. Trust me on that. Number three, moving right along. How can we agitate for righteousness? Lift up the name of Jesus. Uh, work with other organizations. Number three, get behind, pray for, and financially support moral drives like Jabez House. I have personally given funds, my wife and I, to Jabez House and Shamel Rice. They are working to get sex workers off the streets, teach them skills so they can be involved in legitimate activities that are economically self-sustaining so that they can take care of themselves and their families. Um, Imran and Dario Richards, Inspired Leadership Institute, Dean Squires of Combined Faith, Kevin Campbell and his wife going into the prisons and ministering to the prisoners, Nigel Jules, um, Purpose 180 Foundation, some of these I never knew about, but again, Corey Worrell, I lighted them and I borrowed them from him because I don't know all of them, but I made a note purposely so that in the future, when the Lord blesses me with lots of funds, I can give to these organizations. Yes, I got that one there. It's coming, it's coming. Uh, Errol Griffith, my good brother. Errol Griffith, Free Mind Institute. And he doing some really positive stuff, especially for the young people in this nation. Uh, get behind, pray for him, support him. Uh, Ambrose and Maria Carter with Amar Empowerment. My wife was trying to get me to that. And the Pure Sex Center. That's the same uh, Ambrose and Maria Carter. Again, great couple, great brother and sister in the Lord. Uh, Roger Husbands, my good brother. Once has nothing to do with cooking or food, get behind and support what he's doing with the uh, second chance lessons. Very, very good uh, teaching skills to young people. I saw just, I believe yesterday, uh, teaching young men how to do tiling. You know, I, I, this is fantastic. If they're uh, involved in legitimate activities, they'll put money in their pocket. They don't have to go and sell drugs. They don't have to go and get involved in gangs and that kind of foolishness. Uh, this is excellent. There are other people who are helping in other ways, like Yatania Wiggins, uh, Corey Lane with the Nature Fun Ranch, and Fabian Sargent dealing with saving our society. Some of these I have never heard of, but they're there. And then lastly, which I'm sharing, is Crime Stoppers. 
right? And there are different branches of Crime Stoppers that are, that are helping to make a positive impact in our society. And I want you to get involved, support these people. Even if you can't go and join the organization, contribute to it, you know, pray for them, help them in any way you can. Uh, even my mentioning them on this broadcast is helping. Right, so there are ways that you can help, you can get involved. Number four, moving right along again. Number four, pray for, support, and encourage God's people who are in strategic and influential positions in government and civil society. I will repeat that for you. Pray for, support, and encourage God's people who are in strategic and influential positions in government and civil society these people can make a difference and we need to stand with them amen because these people face a, a stream and a tide that is against anything to do with god anything to do with righteousness and we need to support them with our prayers we need to surround them with our prayers ask god to protect them in what they are doing and even though their, their, their context may not be Christian or spiritual, they have the opportunity to express and to represent spiritual things and matters and righteousness in their areas of influence. This is very good stuff. Uh, prayer is definitely a response to a call to action. It is definitely a response to a call to action. One of the active things that we can do is pray. And that's very good. Uh, I forgot to mention, and because I think it was such an important point, um, this was in my very first point, which is a serious call to prayer. I forgot to mention, I'm going to mention it here because it actually fits in with both of the points that I've talked about before. Whenever you are praying, for your nation prayer for the church when you understand the pivotal role of the church in national issues you understand why i would say to you when you are praying for barbados you're praying for india you're praying for united kingdom you're praying for usa you're praying for canada pray for the church in that nation As I am calling the church, I believe through God's providence, I'm calling the church to prayer, I'm calling the church to action. When we pray for the church, we allow God's call to be heard. And we pray that God's people will respond to that call. Uh, Bishop Jerry Seal shared with me some time ago, well, not with me, but I was in the room when he was sharing it, he said, can you imagine, and, and this will come up in another message, can you imagine having, uh, let's say, garbage collectors who understood the issue of righteousness exalting a nation? Can you imagine if your garbage man, when he came to your house to collect your garbage, says a prayer for you? Think about it. And every home he stops by, he says a prayer for the family in those homes. This is a this is a garbage collector. I talked to you about praying for people in in civil uh, responsibilities, but someone collecting garbage. They run a certain route, not every day, but every week for sure. Hopefully. <laughs> And as they run that route, can you imagine that they have this presence of mind to say, hey, this area is my responsibility. It's an area where I can have influence, direct influence in this area. So when I go into that thing and I grab that garbage, Father, in the name of Jesus, they don't have to pray for 15 minutes. You, can, you don't know what's going on behind the doors of that house here. But you and I would never pray for them. But a garbage collector visiting that home once a week can say a prayer for that family. This is just one little example 
of how we can uh, exert that spiritual influence wherever we are, wherever we go, whatever we do. All right, so I just wanted to, to, to bring that to your attention um, that uh, wherever you are um, praying for your nation, remember to pray for the church at the same time as the church's influence on the nation can be very, very effective and nation changing. All right. Uh, uh, I mentioned about the changing weather, the rain has begun to fall. It, I'll, I'll do my best to get the message out and I trust that the rain will go quickly. All right, so I, I've dealt with, a, can you hear it, a, a serious call to prayer and then secondly a serious call to action which I've just completed and now I want to start the third point of this message. Just let me bring it up there on the screen for you. Um, here we are. All right. <clears throat> yeah, you seem to have lost it. Oh, I can't find it. Oh, here you go. Here you go. All right. So today, I want to start my third and final point in this message and in this series can you hear it a serious call to biblical unity a serious call to biblical unity and as I share this point with you today I have purposely listed it as biblical unity because there are other types of unity that exist and I, I, I think for the church our unity has to be biblically based and so I am calling for and I believe God is calling for biblical unity so I hope you've got that my wife had to step out to go and close some windows but she'll be back shortly alright so we begin in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 through 6. Ephesians 4 verse 3 through 6. A series called The Biblical Unity. Um, King James Bible, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you're calling, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. New Living Translation, same verses. Ephesians 4, 3 to 6. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. Final rendering of these verses amplified bible of course be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony and oneness of and produced by the spirit in the binding power of peace there is one body and one spirit just as there's also one hope that belongs to the calling you received there is one lord one faith one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, sovereign over all, pervading all, and living in us all. So, let me give you now a comparison of four sections of these verses in Ephesians 4, my dear, verse 3 through 6. Endeavoring to keep. Make every effort to keep. Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep. Just hold that. What? The unity of the Spirit. United in the Spirit. The harmony and oneness of and produced by the Spirit. I'm hoping that as I repeat these to you, something will stick. In the bond of peace. Binding yourselves together with peace, the bind, in the binding power 
of peace. And one more. This Holy Spirit is in you all, in all, living in us all. No, that may not have made a whole lot of sense to you, but it's going to come into perspective. Trust me on this. The early church was composed of Jews and Gentiles, Jews and non-Jews, and there was always a danger of divisions and strife. That is why deacons were first appointed in Acts chapter 6. The Hellenistic Jews complained that they were being neglected in the daily ministration or the daily sharing out of food. Who were the Hellenistic Jews? Essentially, to cut a long story short, um, there were Jewish Jews or Hebrew Jews or Hebraic Jews and then there were Hellenistic Jews. These were the Jews who uh, didn't stay in and around Jerusalem, Judea, but they moved on to other parts which were, I don't want to say pagan, but they were not Jewish. And so many of them who were scattered around, they adopted the Greek language. And actually the word to Hellenize means to adopt Greek culture and ideas. So the, the Hellenistic Jews who were complaining were Jews who were Greek speakers and in some ways had adopted Greek culture. I know many of you didn't know that, but anyway, you know it now. So, what happened was, whenever you get people and you kind of slam them together in a community, there is that automatic potential for problems always you know this is this is how it goes so there's always danger of discord where, where, where people are brought together with the different tastes different habits uh, a variety of intellect and feelings various modes and levels of education different temperaments um, you know even with my wife and I who've lived in, in harmony for 34 almost 35 34 and a half years uh, we're different people. We have different tastes, different different styles, different likes, and that's a reality. And so, within the, or should it between just two of us, this conflict the, the, you can't you can't get away from. You can't avoid it. The problem is that some couples don't handle the conflict well, but every couple has conflict. I don't care how sweet you are, you're gonna have conflict because you're two different people. And that's one of the challenges of marriage. You put two different people, two different backgrounds, put them on a wrong roof and say live happily ever after. It's not as simple as that. All right? Um, so when you think about the church, when you think about your local church, everything that I mentioned there, except for Hellenism, <laughs> everything I mentioned there is represented in your church. Whether you have five members or 500 members, everything is represented. Therefore, there's always a constant potential for conflict. Always. It cannot be avoided. There's always the, the issue of potential division in the church. So, beloved, when I'm talking about a serious call to unity, I'm talking about something that all of us are confronted with, every single one of us who names the name of Christ. Even if you are online. <laughs> all of us, right? Because even though you may be online, you're still a part of the body of Christ. Right? You can't avoid it. But that is why we, as we go through this point, and talk about how important unity is, that is why we need so much care and caution as we live out our lives in the church. You with me so far? All right? Okay. So, I want you to notice, I want to bring them forcefully to your attention, three things out of these four verses, three, four, five, and six. I want you to notice three things out of these four verses. First one is this. The source of unity in the body of Christ is the Holy Spirit. 
No, I don't want you to get confused. Just listen to what I'm saying. The source of unity and that the, the things that I kept repeating from those verses from different versions of the Bible, that's what it was talking about. The source of unity, once you listen to it or read it again, is the Holy Spirit. We are not the source of unity in the body of Christ. All right? Uh, as I read to you, He lives in us all. The Holy Spirit, who is a source of unity in the body of Christ, lives in all of us as the children of God. We are, in effect, one. Hold on. Don't jump to any conclusions. Spiritual unity already exists in the church completely let me say that again spiritual unity exists in the church already completely we are united by the holy spirit he is a source all right we got it second thing i want you to notice very important from ephesians 4 verse 3 to 6 the bond that unites the church is peace. Peace. That's what keeps us together as the church. That you peace. So if I can if I can apply it this way, whenever that peace disappears. It's gone. And let me even add, it's threatened. Unity trembles. Got it? The bond that keeps us together in unity is peace. I remember years ago when I was at People's Cathedral, I shared a message. And in that message, I talked about let the dove rest. Anything that causes that dove to fly away. You know, the, the peace is gone. It's a threat to unity. Third thing I want you to note. The maintenance. We talked about the source. Source is Holy Spirit. But the maintenance, the keeping of the peace. The keeping of the unity in the body of Christ through peace is our responsibility. The body of Christ. The church. Peace comes, source, Holy Spirit. Peace is maintained, sorry, unity is maintained, my apologies, but unity is maintained through peace. But guess what? We are the ones who have to keep the peace. You feeling me? We are the ones. We are the ones. So while, while we are spiritually united by the Holy Spirit, watch me, we are functionally united by our efforts to keep the peace. There's a difference between spiritual unity and functional unity. So the unity that comes from the Holy Spirit, we can't see that. It's there, but we can't see it. You and I, across the airwaves, are connected by the Holy Spirit. We are united by the Holy Spirit. But because we are united by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean that we function in a united way. That, you and I have to do. And because of... The delicate nature of unity slash peace to keep that unity, boy, it requires diligence, intentionality, and hard work. But there is a serious call from heaven for the church to be functionally united. Let me see how my time is going all right, going good. Um, <clears throat> So let, let me go on. I want to, to consider what unity is not. All right, as we develop this, all right, call it a biblical unity. What unity is not? 
Well, unison is not necessarily unity. Simple way to illustrate it. You have a church meeting on Sunday morning and we sing and we worship in unison. You have a group on the platform ministering, we hope, in song and they sing and they harmonize in unison. So while their voices may be united, their hearts may be far apart. Hmm? We're singing in unison, but our hearts are far apart. I'll stop there, move on. Unity is not uniformity. This is interesting. Unity is not uniformity. Many people think that the two words unity and uniformity are the same. There are several differences between them. Definition. Unity refers to the union or harmony of a group of people. Unity refers to the union or harmony of a group of people. Whereas uniformity is the state of always having the same form, manner, or degree. Having the same form, manner, or degree. I love this part. The key difference between unity and uniformity is their acceptance of differences. <laughs> I need to say that again. The key difference between unity and uniformity is their acceptance of differences. This is very applicable, very relevant for the church. When there is unity, people tend to tolerate and accept differences. <laughs> I have to say that one again too. Where there is unity, people tend to tolerate and accept differences. But uniformity implies that everyone is alike, so there is no room for differences. Mm -hmm. You clicked in? And the church needs to operate in unity, where we accept, acknowledge, and tolerate our differences. I, I, I am, I, let me just say it. There are times when the difference between us hinders our working together. I, 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 have to, I have to say that because it is true. While I am, I am a strong advocate of what this is saying here, that we need to learn to acknowledge, accept, and tolerate our differences, the reality is, look, some personalities just don't work together. They, they, they are serious. You know, you know you meet people who have a very caustic personality. You know what I'm talking about. All of us have been exposed to those people on the job, in the community, um, in the church. There are some people, it is, I, I hate this, sounds so defeated. It's impossible to work with them. Seriously. And, and I think we have to, to exercise the wisdom of God to be able to say, look, I know that God wants me to, to accept that you and I are different. I know God wants us to get along, but you see you. I don't see how I can work with you. Not that I don't want to, but I, it's just that everything we do, we butt in heads. No, I know that I am going into some very dangerous territory and I'm walking on some very thin ice, but I try to be real. You know, I try to be real. And, and there are just some personalities that just, they just don't click together. They don't. Now, I believe, watch me, that each personality has its place in the body of Christ. Those, you see those caustic Christians? There's a work for them to do. Even if that work is to try you. <laughs> they have, there's a place for them in the body. 
And I think we need to, again, accept that. But because we accept it, doesn't mean it's going to be easy to work with it. You got me? But yeah, there is some people, that's just their personality. And you know what? God accepts them just as equally as he accepts you with your absolutely wonderful personality. They're also accepted in the body of Christ. If there is need for judgment, God will take care of that. Right? There are some people that I have met that you cannot talk to. You, you, anything you try to say to them is a problem. You, you just can't talk with them. Right? And, 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 and I also tell you, thank God it's not many. But there are also people who cross the line. Seriously, there, there's some people who, I talk about in the church, who cross the line. And wisdom tells us, see that person? you got to keep them at an arm's distance. So I, I'm trying to give you the reality and the truth of God's word, but at the same time, accept the reality that we are, we are all different, but some of us are so different that it becomes a real challenge to truly work with them how, how that plays itself out i think is between you me and the holy ghost you, you got me there but i'm not i'm not going to stick my head in in a cloud and say oh the bible says that we need to accept everybody yes yes the bible does say that but in reality you got to be able in terms of your practical working of unity in the body of christ sometimes you have to just draw the line and may I say this you got to say a hard no but let me move on, all right? So, unity, watch this. This comes right out of what I was just talking about. This is the last point of this, what unity is not. Unity is not the absence of strife. Unity is not the absence of strife. There may be active strife between people, but they can still function in unity. Hmm? Let me let me give a very simple illustration. Um, uh, marriage. And what I call the philosophy of child rearing. Your role as father and her role as mother. Strife. In terms of how you raise the child, discipline the child, direct the child, guide the child, you know where I'm coming from. I mean, your, your, the way you think and the way they think are very, very, very different. And it causes strife between you. But when you deal with the child, you deal with them as a united front. Am I all right with that there? You, 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 you come together, even though you disagree, you, you understand God's principles, for how the family should operate and you operate in complete unity with that even though there may be strife between you now just one little example so again i'm saying that you may be in in a church you may be in a group within that church and there's strife between you but at the end of the day when i give you this next point you can still do that even though there is strife between you. All right? Good. So, true biblical unity, write this down, true biblical unity is a unity in spirit, purpose, and heart. True biblical unity is a unity in spirit, purpose, and heart. Okay? Who we are, what we desire and what we do. Spirit, purpose, and heart. Who we are, what we desire, and what we do. That's true biblical unity. If we don't have unity in spirit, purpose, and heart, we really don't have unity at all. Uh, 
ultimately, we, as God's people, want to exist for the same reasons, desire the same things, and work together to achieve those things. Let me say that again. As God's people, ultimately we want to exist for the same reasons, desire the same things, and work together to achieve them. Now, let's let, me, let's let me make a decision here as to whether I stop or move on. All right, let me, let me, I'm going to stop there. Let me see how much I have left because I'm going to finish next week. All right, yes, I'll stop there for today. And then next week I'll pick up on, let me see, where is it? Yeah, next week I'll pick up on, it only takes one. <laughs> it only takes one. All right, and we'll start there. So, beloved, let, let me close this down and say to you again, God is calling us to unite together. Ultimately, we cannot accomplish what God put us here to do unless we are truly united in spirit, purpose, and heart. Um, this is not easy. I, I have to tell you that. But because the Holy Spirit lives in all of us, which we clearly stated from Ephesians, then the potential to overcome those difficulties, obstacles, and so on is extremely high. All right? Remember, God has given us all that we need for life and godliness because of the deposit of the Godhead living inside of us. It's the same thing with unity. Right? God has placed His Holy Spirit inside of us so He will give us the wherewithal to live in unity, not unison, but in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. In some ways, regardless of how different they may be from us. There are ways that we can live together without necessarily interacting a lot. Hmm? And just being very, very practical. There are ways that we can live together um, in unity without necessarily having to rub shoulders often. All right? But when you get to the place where, no, you can't speak to me, we're not talking, eh, not quite sure that we're in unity anymore. All right? But that's, that's the kind of stuff we'll deal with uh, next week. So uh, for today, that's sufficient. Let me, let me close in prayer. And then we can go on into our Lord's Day. I can get some rest and continue to uh, deal with stuff I'm dealing with. Father, thank you once again for your word, your truth. Thank you, Lord, that we can come together and, and fellowship around the teaching of your word. And Father, as we've talked the last several weeks about prayer, about action, and today we began talking about biblical unity. Father, there's so much that needs to be done, and there's so much that can be done. And I ask you to forgive us as the church where we have not strived to maintain that unity given by your Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. And we have neglected to do our part. But Father, next week we'll talk more about that. We pray that you will bless your people uh, help us to, to make that effort to do what is necessary in this time. Pray, be, be active, and certainly indeed to come together as one uh, according to your word. Help us, O oh God, to, to find ourselves in the right place with the right mindset to do what is necessary for this time. Continue to open our eyes and to work in our spirits and show us what you would have us to do. We give you thanks. We bless you in the most holy name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Remind you again as I close, uh, those of you who want to contribute towards uh, blessing people with vouchers at Christmas time, 
you need to get in touch with me. I know payday is coming up. It's this week, actually. So you can get in touch with me. Whatever the Lord lays on your heart to do is appreciated. Um, when, I, when I went to India, there was uh, a lady who gave me, I think it was $7. Um, and I, I didn't look down. I didn't despise it. I didn't frown upon it. I, because I learned while I was at Bible school um, not to despise the day of small things. And I can tell you that that $7 went in its entirety to bless a child in India. It may not seem like a lot of money, but she has already contacted me and said, are you sending money to India this year? I said, yes, sir. We, we have $50 for it. So it's grown from 7 to 50 And I'm sure if more comes their way, they will certainly give more than that. But whatever you can do to bless someone here in Barbados at Christmas time, I want to open the door for you to do that. Thank you for being with me today on Online Church with Pastor D. I will see you next week, Sunday morning at 8 o'clock live and about 9.30 on YouTube. God bless you. Have a great Lord's Day.